On this episode of NorCal News Now, we're speaking with Butte County District 2 Supervisor Candidate Deborah Lucero. I'm your co-host, Mike Richmond. And I'm your co-host, Aaron Haar. Aaron, I was going to ask you how you're doing, but I, I have the idea that's not a good thing to ask you. <laughs> uh, maybe not today. I mean, okay. I, I dressed up, Mike, a little, little fashion sense from the Midwest. It's a Midwestern fashion staple is the thick white t-shirt under the uh, collared shirt. So just a just giving you some advice there, man. And those of us who are listening or watching don't know the aroma of Marlboro and Aqua Velva. It's very impressive. It's a staple, yes. It's a, it's a statement. It's definitely that. All right. Well, let's let's turn to the, the good stuff here, Aaron, as much as we like to talk about your fashion sense. Our, our guest on today's show is a well-known community leader with deep experience in community media, arts, culture, heritage, tourism, and agriculture. She currently manages two art agencies and two public access TV stations here in Chico and Reading. Now she's running for a Butte County Supervisor seat. Deborah Lucero, welcome to NorCal News Now. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here. We are excited to have you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah. Well, let's get into it because on this show, you know, we, we, we of course, we try to ask the important questions, the, the big picture policy issues. And, and I know a lot of our, our listeners want to know about that stuff. But we also try to kind of get past that a little bit with our, our guests also. So maybe we can start a little curveball. So you're a, a famous friend of the arts. Yes. So what, what would you say is your, your favorite work of art? Well, that constantly changes because mm. art is constantly changing. And as much as I like all the classics and, um, and, and as much art as I'm fortunate enough to experience, uh, since we have a changing gallery up in Reading, seven shows a year, my favorite current piece is one that I saw in Minneapolis. Mm. Um, right as you get off uh, their wonderful mass transit system, right into the heart of their cultural district, there's this old, it's kind of an old area, you know, that used to be where they traded meat and they, you know, so they have all these huge and timber and all of these really beautiful old buildings. And there are two buildings that are about six stories tall and they have this huge mural of one of our favorite guys. Do you know who I'm going to say? He Prince. Oh, no, it's not a print. No, no. Yeah, that would have been a good guess. And actually there, that would have worked really, really well. But he was inspired by Woody Guthrie, and he was one of those guys that went down in time. Times, they are changing. Bob Dylan. Robert Zimmerman. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's oh. right. So, um, yeah, that's his real name, you know, but we all know him by Bob Dylan. And, mm -hmm. and um, he, it says, times they are changing, and it shows this beautiful, um, very colorful uh, mural of him as a young man and him as an older man. And then times they are changing. And I think that it really sums it up. It's, it's one of those things that no matter what decade we're in or what time frame we're in, it's always changing. And I guess we always think that we are really it mm. while we're here on planet Earth and that times um, they're changing most rapidly for us. But I think with technology and everything that's happening right now, we are in some really wild times. Mm. All right, so Deborah, let, let's get into it. Let's get into the meat of this a little bit. One of the reactions to the 2016 election is a lot more women, certainly we've seen that, have decided to run for office, uh, one office or another. Um, in one sense, um, that's really hopeful for democracy, but at the same time, we know that partisanship, personal attacks um, on and offline are, are at a very high level right now. So what does it feel like for you as a woman, of course, to be stepping into what's a, kind of a combative and partisan and maybe even harsh environment? You know, it's interesting because um, it is different to become a candidate. That has really changed my whole world. Um, in the past few months. But I'm a pretty competitive person. I was, I was uh, you know, into sports my whole life, and I'm competitive. And when you are an advocate for the arts north of Sacramento, you're used to fighting for every scrap, every piece, every bit of anything that you can get, and being told, no, sorry, that's not happening because, uh, you know, Aunt Millie needs oxygen and so-and-so needs this and whatever. So um, I think I'm well prepared because I'm ready to fight for what we need. And we need politicians who are willing to fight um, and willing. And when I mean fight, I don't mean fight like we see on, need I name them, CNN, Fox News, mm -hmm. all of these 
not that, talking over each other, nothing like that. What I want to see is coming together based on facts, based on research, based on reports. What, where can we come together and agree? What, what on here do you agree with? What don't you agree with? Let's work on it. We, we can make something happen. And really, that's what those students uh, were trying to do today. It's like, we need to make something happen. And I'm not willing to let another generation go by without making something happen in this county, something good for this county. We need it. I don't want to see poverty go up two or three more points. We're at 20%. That's ridiculous. It's, we, can't, we just can't do this anymore. Yeah. So um, I'm ready, and I, I want more women to come right behind me or in front of me um, because we need more women. You know, we represent less than 25% of all offices held at the county and state level and federal level. You know, that's crazy. We're 50% of the population. More, yeah. Mm -hmm. 51. Yeah. yeah. So I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. I'm excited. That part excites me probably more than anything else because I think that we'll bring, women will bring a different way of thinking. If they're true to who they are, you know, in terms of being feminine mm -hmm. and in terms of really harnessing that energy and putting it out there, um, I think we can do some powerful things. But I mean, making, making deals too. I mean, sometimes Absolutely. you need to be able to, to conciliate and, and make some deals too. I want to make deals. Yeah. I want to make deals. I want to make deals that are good for our community that would make a difference. And you played a big part in changing the Reading uh, area to the getting in a cultural designation for arts, yes. the Reading Cultural District. Yes. And I think that's got to play a big part in building the tax base and bringing, you know, the tourism dollars that you need, that fourth layer of revenue in. It, it already is. We, we um, garnered a $242,000 grant. Um, the McConnell Foundation, which is one of the largest foundations in the North State, has committed 10 years to the downtown. How awesome are they? They're so and, awesome. And, you know, it was based on that designation because they knew that if the state got behind, and there were only 14 of these designations in the entire state of California, and Redding is one of them. But Redding is building a world-class city. You know, people down here in Chico are like, oh, poor Redding. Well, poor Redding, they have the Sundial Bridge. They have botanical gardens. They've got Turtle Bay. They have the first four-star hotel north of Sacramento. I mean, they have some very rich and beautiful things. And Chico has some very rich and beautiful things. So it's like, why can't we be doing this? Yeah, but Redding's really, really, Redding's really invested in that. Uh, in those dollars to bring that tourism and to yeah. to build that infrastructure to bring those people in. I mean, they are, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, and, and 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 voting to increase tax. You know, they're well, they're they're putting it on the cycle. ballot. I mean, they are going to put a sales tax on the ballot, um, and they've tried it before and it failed. And I think that here in the North State, you know, I would be in favor of a sales tax increase. I think that what people fear is that where is it going to go? Is it going to just go into the black hole that where everything stays the same and nothing changes? Oh, it's going to go to public safety. <laughs> well, supposedly, but again, you know, when we talk about public safety, we can't just keep, you know, arresting people. Our jails are overflowing. Mm -hmm. There has to be different changes, and it has to start earlier than when we meet the person in the street. And a lot of that goes back to our schools. And, uh, and it goes back to the, our communities. Yeah. And it goes back to being a larger community, a more caring community. And you create those things by becoming involved, you know. Well, Mike, I was really excited. Deborah is, was one of the first women in out, out running um, for a seat and a real local icon. Um, so I was real thankful to see someone like that, you know, step up and run. And um, she's running for county supervisor. And, you know, you ask a lot of people who... Who's your county supervisor? They don't quite know. Yep. That's true. And then they don't quite know that it's broken down into districts mm -hmm. to where, you know, you're actually voting for the supervisor in your district to, to be part of that body. But, you know, let's, um, I guess we could just tell our viewers, you know, uh, what are some of the things that a county supervisor does? Well, I think you hit it right on the head that most people don't have a clue what county supervisors do. And I think it's kind of amazing. And maybe I've taken it for granted all these years because I've worked alongside the county for almost 20 years. Um, but uh, they're in charge of a half a billion dollar budget, a little <laughs> over half a billion. It's about $528 million. 
And just to put it in perspective, I think the city of Chico's budget is 110, something like that. So um, basically it affects every one of our lives, all their decisions, whether it's, um, I think they should be actually front and center on the homeless issue. 51% of that budget of the 528 million goes to mental health, behavioral health, um, also Department of Employment Services, and public health. So when you look at just the priorities, if you just wanted to set priorities by budget, that would be a priority, just the health sector and employment services. And as we know, the people that are homeless on the streets, and particularly in downtown Chico, that we see people, we, we get to know them by name, a lot of them we know who they are, um, who they say they are, and a lot of them have mental issues. And um, I think one of the things that really got me thinking about running was working up in Shasta County and seeing how they were approaching their budget, their issues, and all of the agencies that service uh, the homeless population, whether it's nonprofit agencies or agencies within the county or possibly um, city services. So I started looking at what they were doing and thinking, hmm, why couldn't we do something like that here in Chico? They got all the agencies around one table, you know, 24, 26 agencies talking about where are the gaps. What about that kid that came into the Salvation Army who's 15 years old, who has never spent a night out on the street? How are we going to save that kid from even one night out on the street? Just because he made a choice and his parents said, get out. Do you think that the average um, voter, the average constituent really understands for instance, with your taxes, that right. what what is city money versus what is county money? I mean, do they understand how supervisor versus, say, the Chico City Council in this this city operate in terms of affecting their lives? No, I don't. I don't think that the average person understands that. And I think more importantly, what I really see happening is we are always in a squabble over our dollars, and instead of looking at things as how can we solve an issue, how can we become gov solution-based governance. How can we do that versus, well, that's the county's issue or that's the city's issue. We need to be more collaborative. We need to bring more state and federal dollars into this city. We need to have better transportation. We need more housing. You know, I was thinking about the housing issue and I was been reading about it and it was really interesting to me that after the 50s, you know, we kind of went into this suburban kind of way of life. And before that, there used to be boarding homes, boarding houses where you could rent a room. Not everybody wants to be responsible for an entire apartment. They just want a room. They're going to go find some, a place to eat. We don't have boarding houses anymore. We don't have facilities like that for people that may not want to participate in life like we think people should participate. They need a home. They need an apartment. They need this. They need that but we don't have the type of housing anymore that allows for that. So as our city centers, um, as people started moving out and became more suburban and our urban areas lost some of that infill housing, if you will, the rooms, the boarding houses, the old hotels that um, got torn down for big, tall high rises, or in, in our instance here, we just didn't build that way. In Chico, we just don't have that kind of building. And in most rural areas, that's the issue as well. So when you're in, faced in a you know tremendously populated area like San Francisco or L.A., and you want to get out of those kind of places, coming north looks good. But yet, we can't say that all those people are from somewhere else because we know they aren't. A lot of them are right from right here. Yeah, we got really got to educate ourselves on it more because... The, the county gets the continuum of care money. Yes. So to get in order to get that continuum of care money, you have to go care for people. You have to show that you're using that money and caring for people. And that, in turn, gets more grant money, gets uh, gets more money going and, and, and secures the funding. But in the biggest the biggest issue, I guess, for the county right now is is the staffing is, is the public safety, mm -hmm. um, which takes the most part of the budget. And. Fire and fire and sheriffs and fire. You know, I mean, look at look at what we're facing. You know, with climate change, 
I, I just listened to an excellent series on um, PBS, and they were talking about the recent fires in Sonoma and Napa and how 44 people lost their lives. And um, it came down to a breakdown between two counties who had different names for um, dialing, if you reverse dial, you know, and try to evacuate people. There was a different name for it in Napa County than in Sonoma County. So when the operators were talking to one another, they didn't even know what, what they were trying to do. And I thought, wow, that's just such a simple thing. But after I heard it, I thought it really lines up with what I've been feeling and what I've been working on the last seven years of my career. And that's really collaboration with surrounding counties. We can no longer go at this on our own. You know, we are too small. And, and um, you know, the state sets it up in some ways that we are all pitted against one another. But we need to join together. And it's not enough to just have a rural caucus that represents Imperial Valley and then also represents Butte County. Mm -hmm. We need to really come together up here and get a coalition of counties and find out what our significant issues are, which I think fire safety, mm -hmm. police safety, the sheriffs, and cannabis is also a huge issue. It's chaos. Yeah. It's chaos. We, so she, we so need to be smarter. She's saying we have to collaborate a little more yes. with county to county. And that's sort of what the, the new groundwater uh, legislation that's coming, uh, the Sustainability Groundwater yeah. Management Act, stigma. that's kind of what they're proposing too, right? Is uh, We now have to create an agency in the county and, and that agency has to c create a plan and bring it to the county supervisors. Um, and it's got to collaborate with other counties in order to make because water doesn't know when it crosses over the county line. <laughs> right, and we don't want to pit ourselves uh, mm -hmm. uh, against it that way. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of being forced to collaborate at a state level, too. So. Well, I think, I think hopefully, you know, um, the powers that be are beginning to see that while we need local jurisdiction and while I completely and totally believe in that, we also need to be more important to Sacramento. And when you have the coalition that I started for arts and culture up in uh, th these parts called the True North Arts and Culture Alliance, is six counties. It's Butte, Tehama, Shasta, Trinity, Siskiyou, and Modoc. Mm -hmm. And that represents more than 18,000 square miles, mm -hmm. which is larger than nine U.S. states. Mm -hmm. But we have less than 500,000 people. So when you're trying to be important to a state government and a government that is the seventh largest economy in the world... That's not easy. <laughs> With 500,000 people? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, our county actually runs in the negative, right? So we, we actually get more money from the state than we you know, create from the state for the state. So, I mean, I guess that's a question I have, too. Should counties like us who are in the net negative, uh, should, should we get a rule that says we can kind of keep that money? We, we, maybe we know how to spend it better? I mean, you know... I can only speak to the areas that I really know well, and I can tell you that it's difficult for the state, the size of California, to understand each one of its members mm -hmm. because each member has different qualities and different assets that it's working with. And some are very fortunate and some are not so fortunate. We're very fortunate in Butte that we have water. That's a huge asset that we have that the rest of the state needs. Um, we're also fortunate that we have a university here. We're, we are also fortunate to have such a beautiful community like Chico and Paradise and Gridley and Oroville. I love Oroville, you know. Um, but, again, when you're down at the state level and when you're talking to state people, they don't even know how to pronounce butte. It's but, you know, and when you know you're having problems pronouncing the name of your county, you can kind of figure that there's a, not a whole lot of knowledge that goes with that as well. And these people are all making decisions on behalf of all of us. So we have to have a louder voice. And I believe that super, the supervisor position is not being utilized to the fullest extent that it could be. It could be a voice. And when I was a kid, I knew my supervisor. Maybe I was a weird kid, but, you know, I probably was. <laughs> but it was in Tehama County, and I, I knew the supervisors because they were important to us. Well, and that's, that's, that's a good segue, actually, because, you know, the incumbent in this race, uh, Larry Wall, yeah. 
Yes. So Supervisor All Wall. Um, he's a fiscal conservative. I yes. mean, he, he talks about this a lot. Um, he's opposed to raising taxes. He wants the county to live within its means, and he wants to focus on job creation. So why are those bad things, or are they bad things? I don't think any one of those things is bad. Um, I think the approach that Larry has taken for the last 20 years has not resulted in a lot of good creative solutions. I think that taken on their own, any one of those, job creation, who's going to argue with that? And who wouldn't argue with somebody living within their means? You know, um, I think we've learned that it doesn't bode well when we don't. If we did that as individuals, it doesn't work. If we do it as a business, it's not going to work. Um, ultimately, it's not going to work. So how do you solve fiscal issues when there's not a lot of ways for a county to bring in revenue? Um, and we're limited there. One of the things I would like to see, and I don't know that much of this has been done, is I would like to audit some of the departments to understand how they're spending money, what, how many people are being serviced for those funds. And I realize audits take time, mm -hmm. and I realize that they can be expensive, but what I'm concerned about is doing things the same way all, you know, every year and saying, well, we don't have enough money for this, we don't have enough money for that, yet I see the Department of Employment Services is moving out to the North Valley Plaza Mall. That's going to cost, four, well, they're, they're saying about $350,000, which we all know how construction goes. It'll probably be closer to $500,000 at the end of the day. Where did they get the extra money to do something like that? And as a result of that, who isn't being helped um, in their department? Now, maybe that's, you know, these are just things I'm, I'm curious about. I'm not saying there's any ill propriety or anything like that. But I like to look at those things. And since I've been attending meetings, I always have a zillion questions. But I never really am asking those questions because I don't want to seem combative to the incumbents or disrespectful, or, you know, cause, because obviously they've been dealing with a lot of these issues a lot longer than I have. So I do know, though, that when I get in, I want to hit the ground running. And I would like answers on, well, how does that work? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's you know, there's fiscal responsibility. There's also, you know, sucking the, the financial oxygen out of the room. I mean, you need to spend money, invest in people, invest in things like job creation. Yes. Um, so there's a fine line there between, you know, spending enough to keep the county doing what it needs to do, supporting people and also creating jobs and the like, and also not overspending. Yes. So how do you walk that fine line? Well, I, again, I think in a, you know, my parents were both teachers. They both belonged to the teachers union. We grew up, I mean, in the day, my, my, I remember not having a lot of money because my parents were teachers and they chose to be teacher, teachers because they had good health care mm -hmm. and they had good benefits and they had great time off. And that was the trade-off for not receiving a lot of money. Um, now it seems that it's both, you know, we, because when you have the average median income in Butte County being $38,000 and you have management people making $150,000 or $120,000 um, and then the new hires are coming in at lesser, how do we even out that, you know, those pay scales? Because... If 10 people retire and we're funding them at 90% of their income, and that's a million dollars a year just for 10 people, is that sustainable? I, these are huge issues. I mean, everybody's talking about you know, the pension issues and all of that. I don't know yet. I, and I'm looking at it. I went to a workshop on it. I was very astonished at... Um, you know, in three years, we will be in the red in Butte County. And it's primarily because of what we will have to put in to the pensions, which is not funded and not anywhere near funded. So how are we going to deal with the, these issues? And we can't continue to do what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's not working. So these are hard decisions. Yeah. They're I very mean, difficult. Increasing the tax base is always what I mean. You know, we're, when you're looking at expansion, that's kind of the idea. Is, you know, you ex I mean, that's the Republican idea right now at a federal level is you expand the, the revenues through, you know, cutting taxes. And hopefully the growth will then fund more revenue. 
Well, it doesn't and, always work out that way. And, you know, you can start to see an example of that, that theory and the fact that you get a little tick down in unemployment, but the poverty rate goes way up because guess what? Those aren't good paying jobs. Those are part-time jobs. Those are in, you know, are, you know, I've, I've been on ZipRecruiter here lately. Okay. There's not any, <laughs> unless there's something open at the university, mm -hmm. unless there's something open at the school the, or, 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 uh, or the college or local government or whatever, there, there's not a lot of good jobs out there. And, you know, bringing um, the current supervisors who, who, who passed on a, on a new industry, on a, on a new industry could have created new small business that could have created opportunities here uh, that the voters in this county overwhelmingly voted for. Um, and then to, uh, you know, on the back end to say that they're for job and creation, bringing revenue building tax base. I mean, I, I'm not too up on whether those would have been great, great paying jobs, but you know, uh, the poverty rate is has gone up, you know, tremendously to, to 20 points. So yeah. now we're at a situation where um, we're in a really unique situation, and and I don't envy Deborah, uh, you know, for for the role she's taking because um, that situation somebody's going to have to get in there and and really work at it. Um, because it's not going to get better overnight. So. It's not, but we have to start doing something because we are losing our, our infrastructure, you know, because we, we don't have enough money to, I mean, this is a simple thing, but how many have nearly lost a tire on a pothole? Or mm -hmm. if you ride a bicycle around Butte County, be careful. Yeah. Um, well, driving is the most dangerous, you know, fatal thing you could do here. You know, you have a, you have a better chance to do that than, than fly. So there's, yeah, there's uh, there's some scary public safety issues that lie ahead if we if we don't cr correct the situation. And, and I'm not a big believer. You know, I, I've been listening to um, a lot of people, you know, say, well, we just need more police and we need more fire and we need more of this and we need more of that. And the truth is, number one, we can't pay for more. We don't have the funds to pay for more. So we have to look at this situation differently. It's, it's not we cannot use the same tools we have in the past. And that's why I think we need to be collaborative with counties because they're all experiencing the same thing. We're all in the same boat. Well, let me throw you another curveball. All right. If, I don't, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I, I think that we always assume that people that we vote for um, are fully formed and, and are not going to change. Well, we all change. We all change mm -hmm. all the time, right? Yes. So what's something that you've kind of done a 180 in your adult life on? Something that you, maybe even just a year or two or more ago, not even that many years ago, that you've really changed your perspective on it? And how did that come about? Hmm. Well, I think the biggest one would be, and this was when I was much younger, I was probably 30, and, um, and I was not sure about... Um, what it meant to be a homosexual, and if that mm. was right, because I was raised in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and I worked um, with uh, a Christian women's group, and there was a lot of negativity around that, but I just knew that it could not be right. Mm. And um, it always rubbed me wrong. Mm. And then my sister came out, mm. and she came out first to me, and to because she felt I was safe mm. to come out to. And that changed my life. It changed my perspective. It changed, um, you know, I was able to peer into her life and to see what she had to do just simply to, to love someone that, that she wanted to love. And um, I realized that this goes beyond politics and that um, politics should have nothing to do with it, mm -hmm. that our individual choices like that should never be on the table. Um, and that was a big, that was a big 180. I mean, I, I, <laughs> what you're saying is so interesting. I mean, you know, you have this idea that, that there's some sea change, but people are people, right? right. And they're, they're living their lives. I mean, it's like, you know, people are encouraged now to say, well, when did you know you were straight? Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, It's right. like, when did you decide to come out as straight? Right. It's right. like, you think about it, you're like, well, I, and There's my no sister difference. said things right. like that to yeah. me, you know. Um, it was, I mean, we had a great conversation. I was probably a little younger than that because she was, she was, um, I'm six years, no, I was, I was about 30. Mm -hmm. I was 30. Mm -hmm. I never came out against gay mm -hmm. marriage or anything like that. I, I wasn't, I didn't feel that strong, but inside 
I just didn't know if it was right. Well, so, but and and then having her talk to me, I was just like it, it completely changed my whole horizon, and I raised my children that way. Well, what you, the the position you're running for, the, yeah. the seat is is a nonpartisan seat. But I mean, mm -hmm. there certainly, I mean, I don't think any of us these days in this political environment don't kind of think of ourselves on one or the other teams. And certainly when I think about conservative, conservatism, and I think about Christianity, I know those two things are generally very intricately linked. Mm -hmm. You know, many times, you know, church going is one of the things that most closely uh, uh, um, correlated yeah. with uh, people who voted for Donald Trump. You know, yeah. if you're a church goer, you're much more likely to vote for Donald Trump Which than if you were. my mind. But it's very interesting, and yeah. that's why I kind of wanted to explore that with you. So what's your perspective on <laughs> Catholicism, Christianity, and, and how those overlay some political belief systems too? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I really think that, uh, you know, they should not have anything to do with personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, governance is one thing, you know, church should be completely separate, your belief system should be separate from governance. I, I, I Maybe I'm almost libertarian yeah, on that. Checks you and know? balances. I, I just don't believe... That's in the Constitution, I, yeah. I don't believe that, uh, that it, they should be linked at all. And I believe our founding fathers thought that as well. Um, now, some people will pull out different quotes and different things from different founding fathers, which I'm sure if there were some founding mothers, and I'm sure there were, um, they wouldn't want their sons and daughters fighting over those things or killing one another over those things or causing that kind of havoc. So I think those need to be completely separated. And in my mind, they are. Um, I, they, can, they can inform your decisions. You know, they can inform who you are as a person. They can help you morally um, be maybe more upright. But if that were true, and we know that Trump got a lot of that, then what about what's up with Stormy and what's up with uh, you know all this other stuff? I don't know. You know, for for the, for that group to stay behind him in light of all of these things that have come out, we've had presidents get impeached for far less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we. It's a big day. You went you went down and to the plaza today for the mm -hmm. uh, the student walkout, um, which has kind of taken a conversation away from DACA and and some other things, and so has other misgivings of yes. our of our administration of our current administration. But um, you know, Trump was in Trump is in California right now picking out wallpaper for his. <laughs> Or I'm sorry, walls, not wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> Much more serious. Maybe and. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I guess I guess uh, let's talk about Laura's law a little bit. You want to? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one because um, you know because your opponent has had a one hundred and eighty as well. Yeah, over yeah. the course of time, I mean, Laura's it law is, is a um, is a law here in California, which which essentially, and I, I'm I'm very much shortcutting this, but essentially deals with people that are mentally ill that yeah. that uh, that are having uh, uh, issues. Um, and it, it stemmed from uh, an incident where a woman by the name of Laura was, was shot and killed by a mentally uh, ill man. Um, and it really has to do with, as I understand it, um, you know, how we get those people's services, how we are able to provide services, and, and also at the same time protect the rest of the populace from people that right. may be a danger mm -hmm. to others or to themselves. Right. Um, so... 18 counties, I just actually was researching this, have implemented Laura's Law, but Butte isn't one of them. Now, Larry Wall in 2016 said he was open to it, and recently he kind of turned around on that and said he wasn't. I think fiscally was the reason. So mm -hmm. why is Butte not looking more favorably towards Laura's Law, and, and how can, if there's a funding issue involved, mm -hmm. how can the funding be provided? Because it would seem to be a public safety issue at a certain sense here. Well, if if his reasoning is fiscal, I mean, um, what they are saying at the county level is, well, we're going to have to take monies away from some other program to make sure that this program goes into place. But, but it's very difficult to get this program into place, even though it's been around since 2002. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go through the court system to get somebody who's over 18 to basically be court ordered into uh, mental health care. That means that these people have either been hospitalized once or twice in the past three years, there's a lot of regulations about it, or jailed, or they are a harm to themselves. And um, my understanding, and I just read a wonderful opinion piece in the Sacramento Bee 
by a YOLO supervisor who was a, wasn't sure if he liked the impinging on freedom of the individual. Like what if somebody just went and said, you're crazy and got you into some program or, you know, that was his concern. And, and, and he wrote about that in the Sacramento Bee. And he said, after years of implementation now in YOLO, they have found that there's been a 50% reduction in the number of calls um, and people being jailed for having mental health issues as well as hospitalization. And there's been an overall savings. Mm. So in my mind, what I hear from local government many, many times is they make these decisions. And what I would like to know is how they make those decisions. Are they making them because they've audited their department and they know that um, everything they're doing is working fabulously and so they don't need to make any adjustments or the number of people that they're helping um, would be detoured if they implemented this program? I'm curious how decisions are made because I, I think that they need to be more thoughtful. I'd like to see more figures, you know, and I realize everything you ask for requires staff time. But if 51% of a $528 billion budget is spent on health, mental health, public health, public assistance, mm -hmm. and Department of Employment Services, I darn well want to know. That seems to me it's 51% of that budget. Then we should know how those funds are being spent. So say that again. So, so more than half, half a billion dollars in this county. Yes. So 260 million bucks or so right. is allocated towards these very issues. Yes. I mean, I don't know that people appreciate. That's a big number. That's a huge number. It's a big number. For a fairly little county. Yes, it is. Um, and, that, and, and so the idea is, as you say, if we can audit this and begin to understand and get our arms around this a little bit better and see what the, the, the efficacy of it may be. Right. Just purely fiscally. Right. I mean, you know, putting aside, you can't ever or don't want to, but even putting aside the benefits for individuals. Uh, or those that may be at risk from, uh, in the general community. And see where the holes are. I yeah. mean, what I'm hearing, and this again, I'm basing on my attendance at, at this roundtable in Chasta. You know, many times what's happening is we have a lack of certain type, types of health workers. So we don't have social workers who can evaluate the person to get them into this program, which could benefit them, but by the time they find the help, then that person's already down the road, or who knows what might happen. I just believe we can be more effective than we are. You know, I mean, sitting around that table, I was thinking of, a, of an app. You know, if all of these people had an app and that 15-year-old kid went into the Salvation Army and they knew he was going to spend the night on the streets that night, couldn't, without violating his, his privacy, couldn't there have been an alert sent to have someone come and get him and take him to a shelter where he would be safe for that night because Salvation Army couldn't take him mm. because he was underage or whatever the case might have been, you know? there. I mean, there's all these little caveats, you know? And so when you're really trying to help people in these situations, it's difficult. The people that are trying to help them are guided by certain principles, certain laws, there are certain things. So it's it's not easy, you know? Yeah, but going back to Laura's law real quick, I feel like this really sets up a situation where the county deals with the problem before, or the courts, before the police actually have to. Like, but really, I would think that this goes well to help keep police safer and and not and ultimately not have the police have to discharge, or 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 you know something something along those lines of of in dealing with with. Um, someone having a mental health crisis. So, I, I, I just kind of it just kind of struck me about what the taxpayer costs are in that. You know, when 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 we're leaving it up to our police to deal with this, we're not having a proactive measure put in place that could ultimately save a life and, and save some taxpayer dollars. So, um, I don't know. I, and they are, you know, uh, they are putting together this roaming um, health care. Uh, the social worker that social worker goes along with the police. Oh, that's a great idea. And I think that's a good start, you know. However, if what they have been saying is true, where 5% of the population is causing, I forget if it's 85%, <clears throat> excuse me, or 90% of the problems, you know, if you begin to look at that, you know, statistic, it's like we can identify those people. We know who those people are. If we had Laura's Law, we could, we could enforce that. You know, we could possibly get somebody off the street, 
that is going to be a repeat offender. We now have some way of doing that. Right now, we just have a voluntary 72-hour hold, you know, or something like that. And uh, this would actually give us tools. And I think we need that tool. Yeah, and, and the issue of homelessness, I mean, we, we've examined it, Aaron, on, on the show, um, and we're going to be examining it more more closely uh, going forward because it's a, it's a key issue and it could affect so many other issues. Yeah. One part of it that I think I've always thought about is that, you know, we all have compassion for people that are, are find themselves in, in, in a homeless situation. Uh, as you say, there are there are neighbors. They many of the people have, who have homeless who are homeless have grown up here. There are, there are Chico and, and Butte County residents, uh, lifelong residents. But there's also a tension there. I mean, there mm-hmm. there certainly are members of the business community that would prefer that the that our our downtown park doesn't have homeless in it. I would prefer that. Uh, sure. Um, and and there's there's a there's almost an anger. There's a frustration. Frustration, I think, is probably the better word for balancing those things. I mean, people yeah. say, well, you know, people, you know, have their bodily functions because right. we have bathroom issues too where, right. where people can use, use restrooms. And they say, well, what are we going to do about this? We just have to get these people out of here. And it, there's an aggression there and there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a tension there. So how do we balance those things against one another? I mean, we want to be compassionate for the homeless. We want to also respect the business community as well and their, their desires. Well, I think we have to use intelligent compassion. I mean, you know, we are, we have our studios are right across the street from the downtown plaza. And both of our entryways are homeless shelters in the winter. Um, and what we, how we have worked with the homeless population is we made a deal with them. It's basically, you know, at nine o'clock, we need you to clear out of here because we are going to open the doors. And You know, if your stuff is here, it's going to go away. So you need, and we usually give them a day or two or a warning because sometimes it's new people that are coming through. But like, you know, when it's raining, we want them to be able to be undercover. I don't want them to be out in the rain. I don't want to see their stuff ruined either. So it's tough as a business person. You know, we just got tagged with graffiti on our building. Is that frustrating? Yes. Is it costly? Yes. Um... We are not the only city dealing with this, but but as a society, what we're dealing with is the breakdown of our mental health situation and our mental health uh, abilities. Just like the rally I was at today, when I asked the students, I said, when there is an event like this, when there's a school shooting, do you have an assembly? Is there an assembly where you all come together and you're able to ask questions or talk or, you know, they don't do that. And there's, I think the statistic is one nurse for every 1,500 students, something like that in this county. When I was a kid, my nurse, I remember her. If I had a headache, I would go down to the nurse. She would put a cold compress on my head and make me feel like she was my surrogate mom because my mom wasn't there. And I would feel better. Oh, yeah. And what do we give our kids today? What, what are we doing to our youth? You know, we're going to arm, you know, our, our resource officers. We're going to give them guns when they really need more books. They need more nurses in the school. They need more teachers. They need more art. They need more drama. They need things that kids can latch on to and participate in and feel safe. Yeah. And if these kids are walking around with these thoughts in their head, we're not doing something right. We're failing. Yeah. We're failing them. I was getting crackers every day at the nurse's office. Hey, yeah. Hey, I'd put my, my head little, on the furnace, you know, and then ache. go in. <laughs> so, uh, like, getting back to the tax base, too. I, I'm, a, I'm a park worker, so let's go. Yeah. I'll, I'll do a 180-degree confessional today, too. Oh, all right. <clears throat> As a park worker 15 years ago, started having impact, having homelessness and uh, people experiencing homelessness impact my job a lot more than I was normally used to. Right. Uh to the point that it was affecting um, the demand for, you know, what work I was supposed to be doing. And ultimately, uh, you know, the taxpayer was um, burdened but because per- percentage of my time was going into that. And um, I'll tell you, 15 years later, um, there has been 
really no solutions. The solution to to the balance you talk about is to do nothing right. and let's let it fall onto the park workers of California to ultimately deal with this problem. Um, you know, and it doesn't just go to there. The every public safety, as we talked about it, uh, firefighters deal with it, police deal with it, um, you know, and public safety all around, any anybody in public service has to have a percentage of their time now. And it's a huge burden to the taxpayer, what they're finding in the in the studies. Um, that also means it's just cheaper to house them. So I have come around on this issue to find out that when we arm our park rangers, when we do these things, when we create, um, you know, it's a slippery slope. You know, if we, we put guns in schools and we're going to have guns in the parks, we're going to have guns in the movie theaters, it. we're going to have guns in the Changes. churches, we're going to create a prison anywhere yeah. you go and right. guns in the mall. So... At what point do we just say, okay, we're just going to accept that this is the the world, the reality we live in now? Or, uh, you know, I think what these children are saying, they're drawing a line and saying, no, this is absolutely, we're not going to accept this. And I, I'm grateful for that. You know, I'm grateful for them standing up and, and saying that to us because we need to hear it. I wasn't in favor of arming the park rangers. And yeah. I, I don't want to relate the two. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why I am. But I, I guess it is relatable in the fact that the more I've seen homelessness criminalized in my job in the 15 years, the more I've seen retaliation right. and etiquette go to the wayside. In fact, it's, it's, it's common to actually have that sort of retaliation. Uh, in certain areas where you have a different sense, a different, you know, if, if you... If you have the right sense about it and you say, um, hi, Michael, you actually get to know their name. You yeah. actually get to know they're a person. You re- the maze, the reaction they get that that's the most positive thing they heard all day. Or you look at them or you ask them how they're doing or, yeah. And the next thing you know, they're they're creating a, a positive uh, thing by going and picking up trash or taking it right. away. And should, should we have those sort of programs to where they actually are doing stuff and, you know... Um, should we should we ultimately focus on the etiquette and the trash and the cleanup um and and the services that that they need to provide because i think when i'm telling you now i know this from experience when the more we criminalize it the worse and the more desperate they will get and the more um well the more chances they will take and i think that's why we're seeing these petty crime these burglaries going up is because they don't feel a sense that the community is behind them at all i agree i agree I agree too. I, I, um, you know, it it's something that I've thought about a lot because my father was um, a teacher, as I said, but his real passion was to be a fireman. But he had diabetes. He had um, he was Hispanic, Native American, um, got early onset diabetes when he was very young. So he could. He was actually they discovered it when he was in the service, and he always wanted to be a fireman. So. In Corning, where I grew up, we had a volunteer fire department. And so he was able to fulfill that desire by becoming, you know, a very integral part of the Corning Volunteer Fire Department. He would, you know, he loved doing the volunteer work. He loved going every Wednesday night and playing poker with all the guys. They loved to go burn down old buildings. You know, their motto was, let's save the lot. That's just a joke. But anyway... (laughs) But I don't see the ability of people today to plug in as much in a volunteer capacity um, as there used to be because we've professionalized our community so much that I feel that we've pushed away perhaps the people that want to give back, that would enjoy giving back, but they just don't know how to plug in. And and that's another thing that I'm seeing. I think a lack of just... Um, everyday person um, input, whether it's on boards and commissions to um, cleaning up the park, um, being a volunteer, you know, fireman or a volunteer police um, person, you know, coming along, helping. We're humans. We, we like to do this stuff, yeah. you know, and we need to make space for people to help. And we need to not see them as a liability or some other kind yeah. of issue, we need to make space for these people, and we need to do it in government. Yeah. 
I think that that what you're saying is really very, very right on the money because I think that to me the first step away from having a community that functions and functions for everybody is demonizing those that we don't like for whatever reason. Right. It doesn't necessarily have to be along financial lines. Again, mm-hmm. I hate to keep on going back to politics. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you see it with, with liberals and, and conservatives want to demonize one another. Um, and I think that the first step away from that is just to look at people and say, well, we're just people. Yeah. You're, you're a person, I'm a person. We may have different ideas. You know, I'm a person, you're a person. You may be homeless, I may be living in a home. I may have a job, you may not. But whatever that is, if you demonize that person, you can't embrace them as a human being. Immigration reform is the same way. Immigration is a big part of that, where there's a demonization of people that are not from here or not from America. And mm. it's a problem. Uh, and and I mean, I wish it didn't exist, but it does. So like you say, government can be a step towards helping heal those divisions, but it's got to start really in schools, in, in schools. churches, and in, yeah. in, in those areas where people congregate together. Right. And and that's where it should be being taught. And um, it, I, I don't know, you know, like today was a real wake-up call for me to hear um, these students and realize that they didn't have a voice. You know, they really didn't have a voice. And um, I always felt like I, I actually told a story that was when I was in sixth grade. This is a true story. And I was somewhat of a rebel. My dad taught us to be activists. He helped the olive pickers that came through Corny. He spoke Spanish, and so he would interpret at the hospital and in the fire department and wherever there was police department. And um, this one kid in our class, Daniel, had long hair. And this was in a time when, you know, long hair was not okay. And... Our sixth grade teacher was very strict. And this is in corporal punishment was still in existence, okay? <laughs> and um, he uh, told Danny that if he didn't cut his hair, he would be cutting it for him. <laughs> so he came into class and his hair was in a braid and he had his bandana on. And he came up behind Danny and he cut his, his hair off. Wow. And um, <laughs> we were all just like, I can't believe that just happened. So when we when the bell rang, we all went out on the playground, and I organized a sit out. I didn't even know what it was called, but I just knew we were just not going to go back into school, and we were going to protest this teacher's action. So we all, you know, lined up, and when the bell rang, you know, we didn't go in, and we said we're standing behind Danny because he. He shouldn't have had his hair cut, and that wasn't okay. And um, so Danny's now a 56-year-old man who just got in touch with me on Facebook mm-hmm. and related that story that I had to- <laughs> kind of forgotten about. Yeah. He said, I will never forget that day because he felt like he had a friend. Somebody stood up for him, and everybody got behind him. And it was the power of that that changed. It didn't change Mr. Bauer. Whoops, I said his name. Anyway... <laughs> Didn't change him, sure, but it changed all the students. Chain and it and it really changed Danny. It changed he, you, and it changed me. Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, I was on my way going, "Wow, this is cool. We can get out of class and make a statement." And you know, it was fun. It was fun, and it was it was scary. And I did get a SWAT for it, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I took the SWAT for it. But it was uh, one of those things. That sense you got to stand up for someone and to speak truth to power. I mean, is it? Something that comes from your genes or something that comes from experiences up to then? Do you think it's a little of both? I think it's a little of both. You know, like I said, my dad is Native American, Hispanic, spoke Spanish. My grandparents didn't speak English. We grew up in a very small town that, um, you know, a Northern California town where I never heard people call my dad Frank. It was always Paco and Taco and, you know, um, and he was always standing up for people. And I learned that. You know, I learned, and he, he taught us that. If there's somebody that can't do something, you, you stand up for them. And uh, he was on the uh, Teachers Association board at a time when girls' sports, you know, the girls didn't get all the things the guys did. We had to practice in the morning at 6 in the morning or 5 in the morning, and we didn't even have uniforms. We had just regular PE shirts. And he fought to get make sure we had uniforms, that the girls had uniforms, and that we were treated like the boys. So I think it comes from that. 
and I, you know, and my dad's name was Frank. And when at his retirement thing, I remember they said, Frank, you're just too frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, sounds like a good legacy, definitely. Yes. All right, well, Deborah, where can people go to find out more about about your campaign and and your and your your program, what you, you plan to do as county supervisor? Um, well, they can go online at debralucero.us, and Deborah is D-E-B-R-A, and L-U-C-E-R-O dot U-S. And I also have a Facebook page, Vote Deborah Lucero, and Twitter, Vote Deborah Lucero. And yep. and there's some billboards going up I've downtown. seen those, yes. Have you? I oh. have, yes. Oh, good. Deborah um, got a big endorsement last week from the California Nurses Association. Mm-hmm. Not, yes. not an easy endorsement to get by mm-hmm. any means, so the... Some working people come out for her, and uh, um, yeah, really if, if you're if you're one. out there locally and you want to turn off the national scene, there's no better way you can work locally. Politics is local than on a county supervisor and controlling, Amen. you know, uh, uh, who who determines your budget and has your vote there. And and for sure, uh, Deborah's in a heavyweight match. This is one of the ones to, elections to watch. That's why we wanted to have you on. Um, it's one going to be one of the races to watch this this. Well, and- uh, and we should say, we should make it very clear, June 5th is an important day. Yeah. I mean, June 5th is not just, I mean, it is a primary, but I mean, June 5th is pretty much the decision day in your race. Yes. Um, It'll be Larry or I. And Larry's, you know, 20-year politician. Mm-hmm. He's been, he's an incumbent. He he, he has been in, uh, he and uh, his crew started the Tea Party, you know, whatever here. I, mm-hmm. I mean, they've been in power for 20 years. And I think this year is a year where, we're looking for something new and different and creative. And if we don't start getting creative in our institutions, we are not going to have our institutions to worry about because they are, they're breaking down. And um, some people say, yeah, good, great. Institutions are hard to bring back. And we need some foundations in our country. And I think our, our education foundation is huge. You know, I think that our government foundation, like working in nonprofits all these years for 20 years, we work alongside government, and we need the stability of government to be able to do what we do. You know, we can apply our passion and our knowledge and our skill, but we need that stability of government. And, you know, you get the government you vote for, right, Aaron? I mean, you'd agree with that. I mean, I think that you need to you need to get out there and you need to vote. Or yeah. don't vote for it, yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, and, and if you don't vote, you really can't say that you're unhappy with the government that you have. Oh, please so. don't, true. please. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> please, we, need, no we, right. need, we need everybody to come out and vote. It's so important to vote. And- yeah, voting down ballot. I mean, yeah. this, is a, this is a non-presidential election year, so the numbers will be, this is usually a year that the, the older voters, mm-hmm. the more consistent voters vote. Um, so it usually swings, you know, uh, to that more conservative, uh, older order group. So, um, although we got a lot of really cool older people that I'm counting on. Yes. So, you know, are you doing the nursing home tour now? Right? <laughs> I will. If that will, if that's what it takes, man, I'll be out there. I love it. Uh, I'll be that's out great. there. All right. Well, Deborah Lucero, thanks again for joining Thank us you. today. We'll have you back again. We have a few months before June 5th. So yes. June, June 5th. Yes. Yes. That's June day. 5th. Great. All right. Thanks again, Deborah Lucero, for Thank joining you. us. Uh, and don't forget all you out there in NorCal News Now. Uh, sorry, Aaron. Didn't want to step on you, everybody. Uh, NorCal News Now is available wherever you download your podcast. So check us out and subscribe. We can also be found on Facebook at NorCal News Now, where you can post your comments and suggestions for upcoming podcast topics and guests. So thanks all of you for listening in. We'll be back at you soon with another big episode of NorCal News Now. So long.